Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Um, this conference gives me so much energy, <laughs> and I'm just so excited to um, be speaking here, to be speaking to people across the world, so, um, and share some of my passion for this field and what I feel like I've learned from working here for um, a few years and coming over from biostatistics, biology, more medical applications into uh, data science, and um, first at Etsy and then at Stitch Fix. So um, what I want to talk about today is, you know, we sort of talk about data science as like the art of data science. Um, and so I wanted to kind of pull that apart and talk about, you know, the ways in which that analogy is good and especially the ways in which I think it falls a little short. Um, so some quick background on Stitch Fix. So um, I'm going to be using examples from Stitch Fix later on. So I wanted to just, you know, establish a foundation about what the service is. So Stitch Fix is a um, personal styling service. Um, you sign up online. Um, you fill out a questionnaire about yourself. And then um, the user experience for you is that you, you fill out over 40 questions uh, signing up. And then in the mail, you get five hand-picked items from a stylist with like a little note and some suggestions for how to wear the stuff. And then you're able to try that on at home, keep what you want, and send back the rest. Um, and so what's happening behind the scenes, um, I work on the styling recommendations team. So what we do is we have you know, all this inventory. We have some data on the person, especially when they first sign up. And so we can actually do some machine learning to help the stylist choose stuff um, for that person. So we you know, do this, you know, shown it with like little graphs and stuff. But we essentially take the inventory, we create a ranking of it, um, what we think will work best for that person. And then the stylist can go from that ranked list and actually choose the five things that you're going to get. Um, so it's a really fun problem. It's a human in the loop problem in the machine wor learning world. Um, tons of challenges. And I, what I personally work on is what questions we should ask in order to send you stuff that is your style, that fits right. So it's super cool. Clothing is so personal. Um, and I just I really love working there. Um, so, you know, taking a step back about what I want to talk about today, um, you know, we all are sort of you know, saying that we're women in data science, and what does it actually mean to kind of do data science on a daily basis, and what does it look like to tackle a problem? So um, this graphic comes, this is sort of a redrawn version of a graphic from um, Hadley Wickham in the R community. So I'm a big R programmer. I love R, statistical programming language. Um, and yay. <laughs> and so um, the idea here, this is sort of a paradigm that um, he's created for uh, how we do data analysis specifically. And the idea is that you sort of import a data set, you kind of clean it up, you tidy it, is what they call it. Um, and then you sort of enter this playful space where you're exploring the data, you're transforming it, you're creating models, you're visualizing that model output, and then you're, you're kind of going through this cycle where you're looking at graphs, you're thinking about what the graph means, you're doing a model, and you're sort of doing it interactively, right? You're not necessarily like saying out loud what you're doing, but you are going through this very complex thought process. Um, and so another joke, this is borrowed again from Hadley, is that, you know, actually this process of tidying the data ends up being a lot of what we do, right? Um, it's, we like to talk about the fun transformation and the things that come out of it, but there's a lot of, you know, work, programming work that we have to do in order to make this thing happen. Um, and so what I love about this paradigm and sort of exploring data science through this one programming language and through this paradigm they've created is that there's a real emphasis on fluency in the language. So, you know, we have this playful space. We know what's really fun about data science, which is looking at the data and having those insights sort of pop into your head as you're looking at graphs. Um, and so the language can really be a barrier to that. And so there's been a real movement in the past few years, both in R as well as Python and some other programming languages, to really develop good user interfaces for the language, where you aren't limited by your ability to tell your computer what to do. You instead can actually work fluently with that and you know, spend most of your mental energy on that fun part. Um, and so Hadley has this great quote, we may find that the two bottlenecks are what you want to do and how you tell your computer to do it. And a lot of my existing work has been more about how to make it easier to express what you want. So really data science and especially programming languages are about fluency and are about kind of unlocking your creative energy to focus on the fun part of data science. 
And so like thinking about this process of like writing an analysis, or you could even think about this as creating a machine learning pipeline, you're really doing, you're, what you're doing is designing a system um, where you're taking data, you're able to play with it, and then you're able to kind of exit that ramp and do some communication. And system design is really important in order to, to do it very fluently, right? Like the languages you choose, the choices you make about how to import that data, like the choices you make for how to process it. The more that you can become someone who can design that system so that it works with you rather than against you, the more you can free up your energy to do this creative work. So I love thinking about data science as a systems prob uh, problem. I was actually partially inspired by this for the about this by uh, Grady Booch, who is a IBM research fellow um, at IBM Research uh, here in California. And um, he was sort of saying, you know, everything ultimately is a system. And that's so true in data science. And so I spent some time thinking about, well, how do other groups uh, do system design? And I was inspired in this in part by Etsy, where I worked previously, um, where there was a really strong DevOps culture, DevOps being the people who are sort of building all the computer systems that keep the website running, right? Um, and so there's so much here, and I unfortunately don't have time to go into it all, but things like blameless postmortems and things like using opinion native frameworks can really help create those fluent systems that you need in order to do data science well. Um, and I spent a lot of time last year, the last couple of years, sort of trying to evangelize this as much as possible. And I found in general that people were really receptive to it and that this idea that a data science problem ultimately comes down to systems design, that was something that seemed to resonate really well. And so I think like the, the sort of leading to the idea that design thinking and thinking about the design of systems is very important to data science. So again, I was saying, you know, there's this like process and this is sort of what we traditionally talk about as though this is the whole problem, right? But then actually when you get into the nitty gritty, there's this huge, huge kind of like munging the data, getting it into a usable format. And then I think if you zoom out even further, there's an even longer process that is the actual data collection, right? <laughs> like that happens and we don't even really talk about it, but it's, it's so important. Um, and so what I wanna say now is that this focusing on the data collection itself is so important as a data scientist. And I think you can actually unlock some of the biggest like data science problems and some of the most exciting work by thinking about this entire thing as a system, right? And so when we talk about designing the technical system, which now is like that little tiny thing at the end, you know, that's like sort of engineering and systems design. But when you talk about designing the data collection system, that gets much more into like product development, into medical research, into labs. Like there's all sorts of ways that we collect data. And you can't just be thinking about the technical system design anymore. You have to start thinking about the entire process and the people that you're interacting with. And so, you know, one side benefit, I don't know if you saw that it kind of, the arrow kind of moves over. <laughs> and so, like, one of the first benefits is that if you are actually involved in the data collection system, that you don't have to spend as much time cleaning up your data. So if I don't motivate you with anything else, at least you can make your job a little bit less hard by being involved in that data collection process. But um, now I wanna go into an example from Stitch Fix where like being focused as a data scientist on this data collection problem really uh, unlocked a huge business opportunity and a huge, like, like, uh, a huge iteration on our product that was really cool. Um, so I mentioned before that you know, Stitch Fix, you get this box with five items in it and you can keep what you want and send back the rest. And so um, the challenge that we had as a business for the first few years that we were around is that we only get feedback from you on those five items that you sent, or that we sent you, right? And so, I mean, our fastest, um, it's not, you don't have to subscribe to be part of Stitch Fix, but many people do. And so the fastest cadence is one every two to three weeks. So, you know, even throughout a year, that's not that much data. And, you know, with fashion, things go out of season. You don't have, like, one shirt living forever in your data set. So this is a real challenge, and it stopped us from doing a lot of, you know, machine learning problems on our data set because we just, the data was too sparse. And so again, you know, when you're checking out, like if you choose to buy the shirt, you can give us a little bit of feedback on, um, you know, if you like the style or not. But we wanted to have, find a way to collect more data. And so a data scientist at Stitch Fix, um, Chris Moody, actually 
came up and like worked with other data scientists to come up with the idea for what, what was early on called Tinder for clothes. <laughs> Where essentially, you know, instead of like right here you have the image of the cloth, the clothing item, and you don't have to get it physically in order to give some feedback on whether or not you like it. And so um, at Stitch Fix, we have a really great culture of full ownership of a problem that was um, sort of cultivated by our uh, chief algorithms officer, Eric Coulson. Um, and so Chris got to work actually making this application um, using first Facebook Messenger, and then it eventually got baked into our um, website itself. But the idea was to do exactly what you would think Tinder for clothes would do. <laughs> like, you see an image of a piece of clothing, and you can rate if you like or dislike it. It's super simple. Um, it's really fun to play, in my opinion, because you kind of feel like you're both having fun and eating your vegetables because you're making your <laughs> styling algorithm better. So, um, so so this really caught on, and we have, we released a couple quarters ago, we have over a billion ratings on this. So if we went from only getting, you know, five, five feedback items per box to, you know, you can play this and rate 30 to 50 items a day. So that was a huge unlock. And we've learned so much cool stuff from this. Um, uh, data scientist Aaron Boyle did a lot of work creating um, what we call latent style. Um, there's a really cool blog post on it. But essentially, because we had this denser data, we could start to do more, tr like, more machine learning algorithms on it, such as uh, matrix factorization, which she sort of illustrated there, where we can start to tease apart what items are like together, what people are clustering together. And for example, one thing we found um, that's illustrated in the blog post is that um, boho clothes and preppy clothes are like highly polarized from each other, um, which kind of makes sense intuitively, but it's just so gratifying to see that come out in the data where you're seeing like this is a really fundamental difference between how women dress and how you know, clothes are perceived. So one other thing that was really cool about the way that Chris designed this product was that there was always a commitment from early days that we should really enable more lines of investigation through this new platform. So he was viewing it not just as like a simple game, but actually as a new platform for investigation into what clients like and a way to collect data that we can then use to give them better fixes. So I was really intrigued by this idea of, you know, the fact that we had these kind of like different, like different spots in this latent style space where clothes look different but were stylistically the same. So I was able to work um, using R, so using some like new things that come out, statistical programming language, and actually create images of these items that were like especially highly polarized. So this is me kind of like, I, I essentially created like, uh, I don't know, baseball cards or like paper doll clothes um, of items that were highly polarized. And then working with another data scientist on my team, Natalia Gardiel, we were actually able to create outfits from these items that were highly polarized. So because of this data we collected, we were able to create outfits. And then because of the way the platform was created, we were also able to get it back into Style Shuffle. So now instead of just asking you about individual things, we can also say like, well, what is what do you think of this combination of things and what additional information does that give you? I think everyone here can intuitively understand that lots of people can own the same jean jacket but wear it in totally different ways. So, <laughs> like, you know, kind of step, taking a step back, I was talking about there's the system design of the technical system, but then there's also this broader, like, product design. And it might seem kind of intimidating, like, the way to do the best data science is to come up with a totally new application that, you know, people love and that you get billions of data points. One of my collaborators, um, Allison Barros, a product manager I work with, she described it as, like, a geyser of data <laughs> that we were able to unlock. Um, and so what I want to say now is that, you know, being able to do design thinking like that, both system design and more broad product data collection design, it's not this like mythical talent where you're just talking about like Steve Jobs coming up with something brilliant. It's actually a discipline that's been studied, especially here at Stanford, but also more broadly. So I started like looking into this field a little more as I realized that these data science problems are really much more complex than we talk about. 
Um, and some really cool stuff came out that I think is um, really important paradigms for us to start to talk about. So like data science, um, design thinking is very solution focused. And I think that's one of these key differences between academic statistics and kind of data science work is that you're not so much diving into a problem to understand and diagnose the problem. You may more often be iterating toward a solution similar to how an architect or a traditional designer works. There's other things like using the left brain and the right brain and sort of this idea of design thinking as a version of nonverbal rhetoric, which I think is totally true. When we talked about doing, um, like looking at graphs and sort of doing that playful data um, analysis thing, that really is a version of nonverbal rhetoric where you're talking yourself through the data story by looking at graphs, by writing programs, and you might not even be able to verbalize it at first. So I think that data science, design thinking is a huge part of data science. And when we talk about kind of the art of data science, we're kind of missing this like one key point. And um, I love this quote from Nigel Cross, who's one of the premier researchers on design thinking. And he talked about how designability is in fact one of these three fundamental dimensions of human intelligence. Design, science, and art form an and, not an or relationship to create this incredible human cognitive ability. And so I think this is such a cool paradigm. Um, I think it's so key to doing really amazing data science problems. And I encourage you to think about um, design ability more. And so just in these last couple minutes, like how to hone your design abilities. This is you know, very quick intro. But there's some really great books on the subject. Um, there's one, the one in the middle, Designing Your Life, is actually based on a course here at Stanford, I think at the D School. And this is a really great introduction to design thinking because it's actually applying the principles of design thinking to like your life and the choices you've made and you know, kind of non-judgmental observation about here's how I spend my time, here's the things I like, here's the things I don't like. You know, maybe I should change some of the things I'm doing so I enjoy more of my time. Um, so that's a really great introduction. Um, Nigel Cross also has a really accessible um, book and on my podcast uh, that I have with a friend, Roger Pang, we actually went through and like read that book and talked about how it applies to data science. Um, and so that's a tweet from one of the listeners, like, like Instagram amazing tweet of like her reading the book for the podcast. Um, and there's also design sprints developed at Google. So there's lots of resources out there. Another thing that comes up in design thinking literature enough is that you really have to learn through doing. Um, and so we tried this experiment on the podcast we have where we were like, okay, rather than having kind of the Kaggle style um, data challenge where you're given a data set and need to do something, what if you start with a problem and you have to actually think about what data should I collect, what applications could I use, what, you know, what would be reasonable, what were people willing to do versus what you know, would be too difficult to collect. Um, how would you store the data? How would you do the analysis? So that's sort of a fun exercise. We did it with commute time, but there's lots and lots of, uh, you know, I'm sure you can think of many examples from your personal life. And then the last thing, just the last slide here, is that um, the last thing that's super important in design thinking is empathy. And we treat this so often as something that's a fixed character trait. But what I want to just say briefly at the end is that empathy is, my experience of empathy is that it's something that you absolutely can cultivate within yourself. Um, the path I've like, found to be the most effective is through mindfulness and meditation. But there's lots of other things that you can do in order to sort of build this school skill. And again, you know, obviously it's good for your personal happiness, but it's also really important for being a good data scientist. So with that, thank you so much for listening. It's such a thrill.